today to J.C. Burke, a, uh, a writer of books for young people, young adults predominantly. She's written nine young adult books, plus one other one she doesn't like to talk about for slightly younger readers. She lives in North Sydney, and I'm lucky to have her talking to me today. How are you, Jane? Great. Thank you, James. How are you? Look, I'm pretty well. Um, so I first met you, I think, up at some residence up at um, up in Blackheath or somewhere. I think Tom Brennan had just come out. And we had a different thing in common in addition to being writers. We were nurses. So do you want to ah. talk about that just for a minute, how that might have informed what you've gone on to do with your life? Well, I think uh, I think powers of observation. Um, so Nursing is so important in that way, although you don't realise it in terms of it uh, going out to anything else like being a writer. But then I think Anne Tyler may have been a nurse. I think Agatha Christie was a nurse. Like There's a few writers that were nurses. So I think it's got to do with observing the human condition, observing humans at, at just such extremes in their life. And perhaps if you have that slight kind of curiosity or busybody quality where you, where you note that sort of thing, then perhaps that comes out in your writing at some stage. But I, I mean, has it made a difference to you? Oh, I think so. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think for exactly the same reasons that when you, when you're a nurse, you very quickly identify that it doesn't really matter whether somebody's a high court judge or the guy who drives the the the, the uh, posty bike. It's um, mm-hmm. when they get bad news, they all feel the same. When they get good news, they feel the same. And it's you know. A bit like travelling, really, to understand suddenly that people are people. Your your journey to being a nurse came after your your mum passed away when you were about nineteen. Is that something that's informed your writing as well? Do you think? I suppose. I mean, I guess it helps you to understand whether it's pain, whether it's hope. I mean, there must be like a kind of a perhaps a fairly good emotional bank that I subconsciously dig into when I'm writing. Although I'm, you know, it is. It's also subconscious that it's hard to answer these questions, isn't it? Because obviously it has to have played a role. I certainly know with Tom Brennan, the interesting thing is there is a tiny paragraph in that book that I didn't see until I was probably working on about the fourth draft. That actually is my life, and it really freaked me out when I saw it because I never intended for anything of my own to be there on the page. But the interesting thing is that when Tom Brennan went onto the HSC list, I saw that the module that it was in fitted the book perfectly because the most, I guess, the the whole um, turning point of the novel occurs in this little tiny paragraph. Can you remember how that paragraph goes? Or yeah, it says something like, "As Tom, as Tom Brennan, as as we as we steered the corner around the last bend, um, I was still me, Tom Brennan, near eleven child." Middle child, happy, free, no fuss type of, type of bloke. Didn't think about much except my mates. And I've read it out so many times and not off by heart, off by heart almost. But as the statesman shone its headlights up on Daniel's Blue Falcon, up on its up on its side against the tree, the front tyres still spinning, everything I thought I knew about who I was and who the Brennans were changed forever. But that's, that's quite early in the book, isn't it? Yeah, page 76. Can you talk a little bit more about how, you, how that, really was, you said something about that kind of being a microcosm really of your own experience. It was the time that I found out, because I was um, 10 when mum was diagnosed with cancer and it was Anzac Day and I was going to a birthday party and I remember, this is one of those clear memories in my head, I remember walking down the hallway and thinking about whether or not they were going to have musical chairs at the party and then when I turned the corner into mum's bedroom and saw her there packing a bag and then said to her, why are you packing a bag? And she said, I'm going to hospital, I have cancer. Everything changed from that second. And and the strange thing uh, was that I remembered having a conversation with myself in the third person and referring to myself as Jane Burke and thinking, Jane Burke doesn't have a dead mother, I don't have a dead mother, I don't have a sick mother, I've got a mother, I've got a father. And having this very panicked conversation with myself, but, you know, not not out of body, but but you know, in that third person, in a depersonalised kind of way. And I think that's exactly what Tom Brennan did. He referred to himself in the third person. He thought about, hang on, this is not where my life was meant to go and had that moment of absolute clarity where he realised he he was kind of stepping into a transit lounge. Mm. didn't know how long he was going to be trapped in there. It's interesting, isn't it, that you say that you didn't recognise that that paragraph as being reflective of your own experience until you're on the fourth draft or, draft or so. 
never, ever, ever thought about it until yeah, I was probably editing about the fourth draft. And I'll tell you what made me see it was the visual likeness, like the optical kind of description of it. That was the only thing that made me recognise it, that I was comparing this this um, long this long dirt track and turning a corner and then viewing this thing that was there that was going to become, you know, an entire, rep, you know, example of what your new life was going to be, which was exactly for me, walking down a hallway, turning a corner and then viewing something. Um, that was what caught my attention. The, the actual description of it. I've heard you talk about your reasons for going into nursing were, were off the back of your mum's experience and so forth and mm. you became an oncology nurse and so on. But in the interim, in the time when your mum was ill but but hadn't yet passed away, was that were there experiences in there that you later referenced in your writing? Probably with white lies in terms, again, I didn't consciously do it, but obviously these experiences are just so profound and locked away. That experience of being shut out because you're supposedly not old enough to know or understand or be able to deal with what's going on um, and yet having an instinct and, and an understanding of what is going on but not actually being let into that world and the great silence that surrounds that kind of thing. I'm sure you would have viewed that as a nurse, the silence, the lack of dialogue that there is. Mm. What I was interested in hearing you say just then was not being allowed in and being on the outside and, and you're involved in the process, but you're not allowed to actually contribute to the process, if you like, uh, the experience. And I heard someone say that writers need some kind of trauma to kick off their experience as a, or to kick them off as a writer. Is this part of the reason you choose to write for, or not choose, but have been chosen, if you like, by fate to write for young well, people? Agnes, yeah. Possibly, possibly because it, it was a powerful time. It, it's a time that, um, it's funny though because it's a time where I probably have the most amnesia in many ways, you know, lots of things that I don't remember um, and, and really kind of detaching from that time of my life too. You know, I didn't want, to have, I didn't want anything to do with the family. I didn't want to know about mum being sick. It was all... To be honest, a really rude interruption, you know, into my my adolescence, and yet it's funny that I've come back to it now. And perhaps that's why I'm. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I often wonder about that, but you'd have to think that that they're linked, wouldn't you? You'd have to think they are. You would. Have Have you ever? I mean, you will have been asked this question a thousand time, but, times by kids in school sessions, but do you ever think that you're going to go on and write for adults? And I don't mean that as a graduation from the pretend writing of writing for young people, but is yeah, it something yeah. you want to do? Am I going to become a real writer? Well, sure, no. if you want to put it that way. <laughs> I don't. Uh, you know what? Probably like you and like most of us, I don't think about my audience. I don't think about whether I'm a YA writer or what sort of story I'm... I mean, I don't think about the, the genre of the story or the audience. I just... It's more the character and the story itself that takes hold and it just happens to be that my protagonists happen to be around about that age. If I felt inspired to write about a middle-aged housewife, I would, but at this stage, I'm not. Tom Brennan was your big... Your big um, breakthrough book, I suppose you'd call it. But up to then, you had three uh, three other books: White Lies, Red Cardigan, and Nine Letters Long. Can you talk about those? I think I felt like such a newbie. I still do. You know, you still kind of can't work out how you managed to string these stories together. It was such a new experience. Now, when I approached White Lies, because I I won a mentorship through the, the Australian Society of Authors, which is how White Lies was published. I think you had to write 3,000 words and a synopsis and something like that. But what I did without any real thought was I went to the news agency and bought an exercise book and started penning down in a very random way, you know, characterizations and a bit of a plot and I guess more of a feeling. I, I guess it's very much when I write, I guess I'm writing what the character's feeling and I didn't even know that I was planning. I just I just sort of started to do this and then when I actually had to sit down and write the words, that book was with me all the time and that planning book, like all my planning books, have become a much more the novel to me than the actual, you know, paperback that you buy in the shops. To me, the planning book is, is everything. So I guess when I did that, I didn't realise that this was the beginning of a process that was going to continue and become 
um, you know, more organised and, and just such a fundamental part of the way that I write. And I've, all, I've kept writing like that. I tell a story when I do some of my talks about pig hunting. Mm -hmm. But I have, I have to say that I've never actually done it. Ah! But I sometimes go to schools that you've been to and they go, have you been pig hunting like J.C. Burke? <laughs> and the answer I, I have to give is, oh, of course I have. But the truth <laughs> is I haven't. So what, what, this is for your book, Pig Boy. Um, yeah. What was behind you choosing to actually go out there and slaughter wildlife and what was the experience like can you share that vermin, a vermin um, yeah. look the experience was incredible and it's again it's that instinctive thing that perhaps you you can't learn you know i think this is one of the things about being a writer is i just don't believe you can learn it i believe it's so intuitive and i was writing a, a hunting scene but I actually write a gutting scene before I write a hunting scene and I had every bacon buster magazine I could get my hands on I was watching YouTube I'd spoken to the butcher I'd spoken to any bloke that I could you know talk to about pig hunting but I just knew that it wasn't sounding right and I think it's that it's because it's such a sensory overload pig hunting I mean wow that's I just kind of thought I know I'm not getting this right, I'm going to have to do this myself. And it unlocked the entire, oh, and it was incredible. I was so, it was really clunky, the descriptions, um, but I actually felt that it worked. I, I mean, I think for someone who hadn't been pig hunting and only went once, I think I did a pretty good job of the scenes and certainly lots of country boys have, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've read the passages to them and stuff. Um, and the other great thing was that my character had never um, hunted a pig or gutted a pig before either. So he was having that first time experience like I was and he wasn't into the idea of it either. So it would kind of combine combine the two. Mm. So it was fantastic. Just, you know, and, and it was a real dust bowl. It was, in the, it was really in the middle of the drought and the way, oh, the dogs are howling and the pigs are squealing and, and there's just so much going on. But the, the thing that, that really oh, it just struck me was that once the pig was shot, there was this silence. Probably only went for about 10 seconds, but it was just this incredible silence after this absolute hullabaloo that was going on. There would just be this incredible um, silence. But luckily what I did was I took photographs. So I do slideshows where my arm is up to my shoulder in pig. Hmm. And I'm going to get you to send me a couple of those so I can put them on this video. Okay, I'll <laughs> I'm very proud of them. Oh, you should be. And was there a moment there where you went, I, I actually don't think I can do this? No. No? Oh, no, nervous. I remember all the operations you used to have to, remember the hemimandibulectomies where they used to peel the face off? God, I got through one of them, you know. Yes, but the difference between that and the pig is that that person, you know, depending on the surgeon and the anaesthetist, is going to survive the experience, whereas this, <laughs> this poor little Paul Vine isn't going to but they're not little babes, you see, no, that's the that's thing. True. They're not little pink, squishy things. They're big and they're ugly and they're, they're terrifying. And the amazing thing was trying to get a knife into one was like trying to get a knife into a brick wall. Uh, it, it took such muscle power to get that knife in, I can't tell you. It was, it was, it was like trying to get it into, into this block of wood or brick or concrete or something. So that was, yeah. It was good and, and it was great because um, I went, um, I, I caught the train home and had my laptop with me and I think it's about a, it was about a four or five hour train ride and it was great, you know, that experience where I just couldn't wait to open up my laptop and just start writing because it was all so fresh in my mind and I just knew that I had done the right thing and I kept my shirt in a plastic bag and I kept it in my um, office for a few weeks and every now and then, you know, I'd just open it up and have a bit of a smell. Because it just, you just, it's so hard to describe the scent of pig. Um, but it would, um, just, it would take me back there. So it was, um, it was good. Um, I've had surfing lessons too. <laughs> but surfing lessons aren't anywhere near as interesting to, 
to 15 year old boys or 45 year old boys <laughs> you don't want to hear about them saying that they had to get the titanic out for me so i could stand up which was a board about 20 feet long and about 20 feet wide okay so this was for was this for star the starfish sisters originally for white lies yeah. right white lies yeah but yeah i did use it in starfish sisters too but i can't help thinking that if if you're going to you know you, you can successfully gut a pig on the first go with instruction but you can't successfully write a surfboard the first go with instruction which means that if you're going to write if you're going to do a kirsty eager and write flowingly yeah. about the way people surf you need yeah. to be a, a good surfer like Kirsty Eager so at what point did yeah. you um, realise that I'm well, a good I'm... enough surfer to write about this or I'm going to have to write about a shit surfer <laughs> well I interviewed people I interviewed lots I was living up in the northern beaches then so all my neighbours were young surfers and and I think once you start reading it and once you start talking you start to get into a bit of a flow of the language and you get to sort of understand how a wave works, you know, the lip and the 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 barrel and the the wall and all that kind of thing. It's kind of a little bit scientific. So what what what's next on this sort of method method writing kind of thing? I mean, no. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I just wrote a book where there's a girl in it who's a diver. I didn't do any diving. Right. Um no, no, no method, no, no method plan for the short term. People talk about how there's so many books for young people that are written and set in, or are set in country, rural areas, and a number of your books have been mm. like that. Whereas the majority of us, ninety something percent of us, live in in cities. What's your take on that? What's our fascination with with that? Do you think? Certainly for me with um, Pig Boy and Tom Brennan, the towns were like characters and, and they were used to manipulate the story and tell us more about the protagonist and I really used them to my advantage. So that, that was very intentionally. I intentionally planned them in small towns. Um, is it also because you is it because your social interactions are more nimble and malleable when there's less people to oh, think absolutely. about yeah yeah and 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 the um the, the significance of events in a small town is heightened you when know, everybody you, knows that kid or knows everybody and you can't get lost and i think that um for those two books i needed that 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 background i needed that the people to be living in that environment otherwise the story can't sort of bounce in the same way that it would if it was in a big city. Well, it would. I suppose it could. It would just be different. I love that. I love what you said then about you can't get lost. I think that's an important important part of YA because um, young adults, I know we talk about belonging and it's, it, it's kind of a bit of a throwaway line, this belonging thing, because I think that's really what all YA is about essentially. But this idea of being lost, I think, is really lovely because we do. you're right, we do spend a lot of time in our urban fiction of young people spending time alone or trying to hide in the in the in the shadows but as you say even even when you're in this wide open regional kind of area it is hard to get lost out there yeah it is it is and, and it, it can be incredibly claustrophobic and incredibly isolating as well i think in those in those small towns yeah well, i'm fascinated by that from my own point of view because as you know with with some of my books i've done the same thing with town yeah. of course i had the, the character in town who everybody thinks they know what she's like even though it's not really who she's like and and so I was kind of taken with that in your own in Tom Brennan particularly that the idea of the town being a a character and not a terribly nice character a lot of the time no but but I think a very typical character too mm. so what are you working on at the moment with the diving what's what's going on there well that's just come out that's called pretty girl that's my new novel that came out last week tell us a little bit about that one okay well that's about four girls who start university college together and they're all very, very close friends. Um, they all have been to boarding school together and they've all happened to get into the same very prestigious uh, college at this university. And it's about that first year out of university. Um, it, it, it is actually a thriller, but um, I guess it's that time where I think the, the boundaries really change. You all of a sudden don't have that kind of safety around you. And it's very much about that. It's about um, being a female. It's about being um, 
I guess, the predatorial nature of some boys, that incredible sense of needing to belong in those universities. I mean, all those incredible initiations and that kind of wild sort of time that goes on, how it's kind of difficult to pace yourself. And this is all happening whilst at the same time, um, one of the, the girl that's the diver is found down the bottom of the um, University Olympic pool. Um, so she's, she's found down the bottom of the pool unconscious. She's got a she's got like a subdural hematoma, you know, or something like that. We'll throw in a bit of throw in a bit of lingo, um, and she's um, she's on a ventilator and takes a long time. She's in rehab and she's suffered amnesia and lost about the last three days of her life. Meanwhile, one of the other girls is found um, at the bottom of the at the entrance to the laundry of the college. She's fallen off the old peaked slate roof of of the college laundry, and she's dead. And you. Hear the stories from two viewpoints, from the girl that's had the diving accident and one of the other girls, Sarah, who's still at the college. Um, you hear their stories and I guess they're, you hear one from forward, you hear one, you know, going in, in, in a, a, a chronological line and the other one you hear coming backwards and they kind of meet at the time where you realise, hang on, something's not right about what's really going on. So when you play around with those, with that sort of structure where you exper- or doing different things like having... What, you know what, the way you just described it are you doing that purely because it's the best way to tell that story or, or is it something that you're doing for your own enjoyment and challenge as well because oh. that sounds like that sounds like a very challenging way to tell that story unless it's the only well, way to tell it. No, it it was challenging and i can tell you what um after i handed in the first draft and had about a three-hour meeting with my publishers who weren't over the moon about it um i went back home and deleted about 94,000 words of it yeah and uh and started you know and didn't start all over again but but pretty much and I think part of that flow wasn't quite happening I was trying to get that you know the two stories you know converging at that point and that had that took a lot of work and I think it's that strange thing where you all of a sudden realize that all this that you, you need you're just constantly going back through the manuscript and planting these incidental phrases, which are so incidental to the reader, but so incredibly important. Um, that was something I, I had to do a lot of. And I guess just keeping track all the time of, you know, what day of the week it was and what this girl had said that, which meant that this girl would be in this time frame. You know, it's like keeping a ledger. It's sort I of guess, yeah. quite methodic about it. I guess that's a really important point for any any um, young writers who might be watching this now is this idea that foreshadowing is something that you actually can't always do on the first run through. Oh, this is why you have to do it fifth, sixth draft in is where you go back and add that foreshadowing that makes your reader go, oh, that's so brilliant how they, they, they kind of hinted at that earlier. And you go, well, it looks brilliant, but it's actually just something we do on a latter draft. Yeah, exactly. And, and I was doing that up to the, a couple of days before it was going to the printer. I was still adding things in. I mean, this book was finished at the absolute, you know, last second and I was still going through it. But I had a, one of a girl that read it the other day contacted me and said, and, and it, it, it worked. She said, I didn't realise that that was happening. But then I thought, hang on, he did talk about that person all the time. But I didn't really, you know, it's that lovely kind of thing where you're aware of it, but it gives you that kind of, ah, yes, yeah, sort of moment, you know, that you have after you read a book that, I mean, I, was, I find that so rewarding as a reader. So I was really, really happy to hear that because it was a very, it was a really hard, I don't know why, but it was a really hard book to write. Don't know why, it, but perhaps it was, you know, in, in the structure of it, it was so specific. The number of schools of thought with young adult writing about things like sex and and um, and drugs and so forth. What's your feeling on covering those things in these books? Do you feel like you're encouraging young people to try things they wouldn't otherwise try? I mean, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but I'd like to hear you say it. No, no, I don't. But I think that when you are that age, a lot of you are having sex and taking drugs, and I think it's nice to hear that there's some sort of safe way where you can read about it, where you can read about other people's experiences because not everybody is, I mean, people will talk about these things in a very general way, you know, and they'll share it with their girlfriends. But there is a point, I think, where they'll stop and they won't actually say, 
how they feel about what their body looks like or how you negotiate that in sex or you know all that kind of stuff that's really again it's 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 not really spoken about and um i think they're the bits in the book that are important rather than just the partying and stuff it's those moments where where you're trying to work out um you know how you appear how you appear and i don't mean that just physically i mean in in all sorts of ways I suppose too that when a young person, when a young woman, for example, has sex for the first time, if it's if it's quite awkward, they possibly feel like that's a little bit of an aberration on their part, since exactly. all these people they see on porn sites seem to be doing it perfectly easily the first time. Exactly, and on the movies, you know, the movies where wow, they all make it look so coordinated and fabulous, and and you know, and that's and that's what I talk about, you know, the weird noises, the weird kind of you know contortion, contorted positions, and. And all that stuff that can be, you know, quite ugly if it's new to you and you're not comfortable with it. But, you know, I remember we all have girl, we all had girlfriends and, and I don't know whether you find it with your daughters, with mine too, where, you know, a lot of them are telling stories that aren't true. A lot of them are talking about these sort of incredibly amazing experiences they're having, which they're pro- probably most likely not having. All right, we're probably going to wrap it up in a minute, but um, thanks for chatting with me. Okay, no okay. worries, and I'll send you those um, pictures. So Sound where do I hang up then? Oh, just the, the red phone. Oh, the red phone, there you go. Yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. see you, thanks. Okay, see you, James, bye.